Hey, welcome to uh, episode 21 of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, where we celebrate the greatest storyteller of the 21st century, of the 20th century. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books about what I call pre-digital pop culture, like pulp magazines, old time radio and such. And I keep a blog about such things. And I'm joined here today by my two co-hosts. Co uh, Jess, go ahead. My name is Jess Terrell, and if you're on Facebook, you would know me from the Facebook discussion group, The Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs. We talk Burroughs per near 24-7, have a great time there. We are now over 5,000 members. we got room for plenty more, so please come join us for The Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I'm Scott Stewart, a freelance writer, editor, uh, done a little bit of everything, I guess, when it comes to comics, film, and anything in background, and Looking forward to uh, talking with Al tonight. Yeah, we do have a guest here tonight. We are, are talking with Al Bull, who was the writer and um, director of the 2012 documentary Tarzan, Lord of the Louisiana Jungle, which was about the first full-length uh, Tarzan movie, uh, the silent movie starting Elmo, starring Elmo Lincoln, which was released in 1918, correct? Sure. Um, and Al is responsible for a superb documentary on that. Um, and uh, we are going to be talking with him about that today. Um, Al, what I wanted to start with, though, is when did you first become a fan of Edgar Rice Burroughs? Did you first experience them through the books or movies or what have you? Well, uh, like most Americans I, my age and our age, uh, through the television uh, seeing the Johnny Weissmiller films and Lex Barker and Buster Crabbe and Bruce Bennett or Herman Hendricks, whatever you want to call him. Uh, and then, of course, Gordon Scott. I saw him at the drive-in and uh, Jock Mahoney. I saw him in three, uh, his two films. Uh, but I, I love Tarzan and we play Tarzan a lot. You know, I, I lived on the edge of town, so we had a giant we had cotton fields that went for probably 20 miles. So we played out in those cotton fields, Tarzan all the time. And uh, uh, and I just uh, like that so much. I know when I was a kid, um, Jock Mahoney came to Shreveport where I, I live in Bossier City, which is across the river from Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, Mahoney came with uh, the three, uh, three something of, Three something of Tarzan. It's uh, I can't remember the title, mm -hmm. but he came to Shreveport to promote it. And uh, what really got me is we got there that night and they gave us all black and white five by sevens, and we were so excited, just knew he was going to come out and do the yell or swing onto the stage or wear his long loin cloth. But they introduced him. He walked out in a three three piece brown suit, walked across the stage, never once looked at us never waved his hand that just walked across the stage from one side to the other and disappeared <laughs> but once the movie uh started we all was forgiven because it was a great film so uh that that's really and then I, I read the tarzan books uh probably in my 30s i started reading the books uh and really enjoyed that that movie would be tarzan's three challenges the jock mahomes yes, 19, that's 1963. Right. Yeah, that's that a was, great. That was a Mahoney's uh, second Tarzan movie and began. Well, that the prior to that was uh, Tarzan goes to India. That began to, to plant the idea of Tarzan being a world traveling problem solver, which we saw in some of the Mike Henry films, also. Yeah, I like the way that Mahoney portrayed him too. He's very natural in the Tarzan skin, and uh, you know, stunt man and all that in history. Uh, so he, I thought he did an excellent job. I like those movies very much. Mm -hmm. just, just, I don't want to digress, but just a nice bit of trivia is Jock Mahoney played a villain in a two-part episode of the, of the Ron Ailey TV series. So, yeah, yeah. I, I actually had that on DVD. Yeah, I do long. too. It's a great, great pair of episodes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I really, I liked Ron Ailey too a lot. Mm -hmm. He's a very nice man. Of course, he's yeah. not in good health now, but... Uh, has been through an awful lot recently, but very nice person. Mm -hmm. So, okay. as so far I'll, as the Tarzan, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I was just going to um, ask you how you came about making the documentary. 
when I was uh, in South Louisiana and I was having lunch and with a, lunch, a breakfast rather with a group of businessmen, and one of them just mentioned that he was from Morgan City and that's where they made the first Tarzan movie. Of course, when I heard Tarzan, my ears perked up. But then he said, you know, they brought in apes and uh, monkeys and all kind of animals. And when, uh, when the film was finished, they just left them because they couldn't get them back in the cages. <laughs> and uh, boy, that just was like a hook in my jaw. You know, I thought, <laughs> are there monkeys down there, you know, in that uh, section of the world? Because uh, that, that uh, Chaffalaya Swamp covers 600, uh, I, don't know, man, I don't know how many, how big it is. It's giant, you know, all the way from above Baton Rouge all the way to the coast. So it's a large, large swamp. And so that just stayed with me. Are there still monkeys there? And uh, in the meantime, my daughter went to school and she studied uh, film and graphic design and so at UL Lafayette, uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette. And she started making documentaries and they've done really well for her. And uh, so as she was getting ready to graduate, uh, we got together in 2009 and, and my wife and Allison and I, and we decided to, we want to make this documentary because no one's done it. A lot of people have talked about doing that because it's such an interesting story about the first Tarzan movie being made in Louisiana. Plus at that time, they had just started the uh, uh, in tax incentives for the movies to come to Louisiana. And it was a big booming business. So we, uh, we decided, yes, we will do it. And so we spent the next four years uh, working on the documentary and shooting it and editing it and, and everything. And so it, it just it was a labor of love. And I was working full time uh, as in a, at, a, art, at a museum, uh, science museum, as a graphic artist and uh, also the art director. And uh, so I would do all that on my own time and my own money. And so I just, uh, we, we went for it, we made the film and uh, I watched it this past weekend. I haven't seen it in a number of years, but uh, I was just pleasantly surprised how much I liked the way the film turned out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not tooting my own horn. It was just, you know, it's just something mm -hmm. you work so hard on and that to have Allison, who was an excellent, uh, documentarian work with you is, was incredible. So that's that's how I started with the film. Okay. Well, have you, I suspect your daughter has, but have you been involved in any other documentaries besides this one? No, not really. Uh, it's one of those things you, uh, I wanted to make a film, but if you're gonna invest four years of your life, you sure better believe in it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and also one of the first things that my daughter told us uh, when we met that first time, she said, Dad, let me just tell you, no matter what you do, you're not going to make any money. <laughs> and uh, I said, I understand that. But with my years of marketing and stuff, I figured, well, heck, I can I can I could probably make money off of it, you know. And I want you to know, I pulled out every stop I, I did. I put on the publicist hat. And also the politician had, and I got the state involved and I got the governor involved and, and the uh, tourism bureau involved. And uh, we, we had a big Tarzan festival, but the only, only legitimate festival in the history of the character in Morgan City. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we also screened the film one night, the documentary, and the next night we screened our version of the Tarzan film with, and we had live musicians play the music. And uh, it was very successful. Also, as a result, I curated a, 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 a Tarzan exhibition uh, for a whole year at the Louisiana State Museum. And uh, that was, a, it turned out very successful to, for us also. And uh, a lot of people contributed things to us for that exhibition. Joe Kubert was so kind to give stuff and you know, he's a Tarzan, you guys know who he is, yeah. but uh, he, he was a Tarzan uh, writer and not writer, but uh, adapter and guy from DC Comics. Right. If I get to Ramlin, just jump in and stop me. No, it's no problem. This is all interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and the documentary, I have to say, turned out superbly. 
Um, I love the way it's structured. I, I really enjoy that you do a brief overview of history in the 1910s and 20s so that we understand the context with which this movie was made. Uh, I enjoyed the brief biography of, of Edgar Rice Burroughs, which also helped set it up. So I love that you took the time to set up the cultural and historical context of when this movie was made, um, which I think gives everybody a better appreciation of the movie itself. So. I, had, I, had a, I showed it in a theater in New Orleans. To, uh, I showed both films. Mm -hmm. And when we showed the documentary at the end, we had a question and answer period. And uh, the first guy that piped up, he said, uh, he said, I liked everything, but I didn't like the history part of it. Why did you feel the need to do that? And I thought the audience was going to kill him. I mean, they, <laughs> <laughs> they all said they thought that was one of the best parts to give that context of what in the world was going on. And you talk about a year mm -hmm. or two years, you know, with the first war and the swine flu and women's right. women's suffrage and uh, the, the, the amount of lynchings you had and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the rise of NAACP as well as the KKK and and uh, all this is uh, it's incredible what was happening in that year that this film happened to be made. Even for those who need, even for those who think they know history, when you're discussing a historical artifact like this. And before you even start, this film is a hundred. The, the film that you're doing the documentary about is already a hundred years old yeah. or, or close to it. So, when you're discussing the historical uh, circumstances, it, I think it is essential to put it in context so you can understand people's perspective and issues that they were dealing with and influences going on in society in those days. And it all it helps it all to fit in, it puts it in perspective or in context, exactly as you said. So, that was it very necessary and I think a very very well done portion. It of is. If, if you watch just an example off the top of my head, if you watched Casablanca without knowing anything about World War II, you wouldn't appreciate the movie half as much. Well you know, said. That, yeah, well said. same sort of situation. You need to know the culture of the time and what was going on in the world. Then you better appreciate the film. So it was just one of your wisest decisions was to do that little history bit. And it's nice to hear that most of the audience appreciated it. So, I was thankful I was able to get so much footage, mm -hmm. you know, from that time period. I was able to buy it and use it and all that. <clears throat> well, I thought it was really important to, to address it ahead of time because we ran into similar things when the uh, last Tarzan movie came out where people are saying, you know, referring to him as the great white savior and, and that Tarzan has passed his prime. He doesn't fit in today's society. I think it's really important to put in there saying, hey, this was pre-World War I and World War I and the things that were happening in the world. And that's why maybe the books and stories were written in this type of connotation or this type of uh, uh, viewpoint on different characters. Because that's just the way, of, that's the way the world was at the time. The current state of the world, and that's all they knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I often I watch a lot of silent films, you know, Chaplin, Keaton, and that sort of thing. And I always remind my wife, I say, you know, remember all the furniture they're in, they're not walking around in a flea market. This this was all new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this all these antiques were brand new at that time. Right. And uh, so when you think about it in the context of that, I think it's kind of cool that you're you're actually seeing a time capsule. Mm-hmm. That's that's it, right, that right there. That's a good phrase to use. Time capsule. It is. It's a segment from the past. Yeah, but it also kind of shows how universal the stories are that we can still just enjoy them as adventure stories. Burroughs, both this film and Burroughs' novels and all of that. So you you need the context to best appreciate them, but there's still a timelessness to it. Isn't he an incredible writer? He is. I mean, he yeah. writes like butter. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh... Yes. Go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's all I was going to. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I've read so much of his stuff oh. now. Yeah. I'm just always amazed. I've read, I've read Tarzan the Apes mm -hmm. 10 to 12 times easy. Mm -hmm. I could read it today. Yeah. And those yeah. stories stood the test of time. Classic. Yes, did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I also want the overall structure of the movie divided it kind of into structures with us, uh, into chapters <laughs> with title cards about the various subjects. You know, so you do you know, a, a chapter on, you know, racial attitudes of the time, which is important. Or you do a chapter on, you know, Elmo Lincoln and so on and so forth. 
And I thought that was a very effective and clear way to organize the information you had. So it, it put everything together in appropriate context and uh, let you follow along really well. Uh, it was uh, just a superbly structured documentary. Well, that's, that's, thank you very much. I, I wanted to use the uh, speech slates or whatever they called them at that time concept for the chapters, you know, beginning and, and that sort of thing. And I, I wanted to, to build from the history to Burroughs to uh, the film in Morgan City. And, and uh, you know, when you, when you go to Morgan City, uh, they all know the film was made there, but it doesn't, and, and they appreciate it. But I had this marketing background. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just don't think they uh, they get it all the time. I mean, like Shannon Hardware, you saw it in the documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, I went in there and told him, I said, you know, this this is the place they rented mm -hmm. to work on this the props and the all the stuff for the Tars movie. They go, what? What are you talking about? You know, they didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I mean, if, if it were me, I'd have a giant gorilla out in front of it, and I'd have, you <laughs> have your picture made, and I'd have all kind of Tarzan things in the store, you know? Yeah. And, they and just, then you might have to explain to them who Tarzan is. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. right. and, uh, but it uh, it was an amazing thing. Now, the yeah. state was excited because of the tax incentives. It kind of, it kind of was a, uh, and as you saw in the film, the the, the boat that was used in the Tarzan film was also used in Benjamin Buttons. Mm -hmm. So you have this arc, story arc for the, the film industry in Louisiana. Mm. Well, you, cool. you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, Shannon Hardware. I've got a list of four locations here. One of those being Shannon Hardware that was significant in the production of this film. The other, and forgive me if I, if I butcher these names, please correct me because I want to get them correctly. Uh, there was Shannon Hardware. There was a Boca Island. Mm -hmm. uh, Lake End Park and yeah. uh, Atchafalaya River Basin. How did I do? Uh, a Chafalaya. A Chafalaya, forgive me. That's all right. Yes, you were correct. Now, Boca Island is, is privately owned, so we couldn't go on that island. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let us. Uh, but a lot of it was shot there, and uh, a lot of it shot up. If you take the swamp tour, they take you up where it was shot. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's not any land there left where, where it was shot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and as they say in the documentary, because of hurricanes and sort of thing, the vines are gone and things. So uh, it, it, it's a little, there's nothing left of the set for the right. Chapalaya Basin. Uh, but Lake End Park looks very similar to the way it looked back then, except uh, they don't have the Palmetto huts that actually were there. Mm -hmm. Do they, but there's still moss around in that area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's still plenty of moss. That that was one of the redeeming qualities. Once they, once as I understand from your documentary, that was one of the things that appealed about the about that area. Once they got there and discovered that there was moss in the area, they checked the Burroughs books, and Burroughs specifically stated moss in Africa. Yeah, I don't know if they have moss in Africa, but they definitely had it in the Burroughs. You know, of course, he had yeah. never been there. Well, yeah, well, I mean, correct. He ever went yeah, there. It, it, no tigers either. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, yes, you are correct. What I meant was it was stated as such in the book. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean it was there in reality. But the thing that one of the things, and this comes up in my discussion group, uh, Burroughs Africa is not necessarily the Africa that we have in reality. I, I think of it as being an alternate universe. So things could be a little different there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you might have moss in the Burroughs fictional Africa, but not in the real Africa. You might, she was, you might have dinosaurs in a region of Burroughs <laughs> fictional Africa, which you do in Paludan, but Paludan does not exist in the real world. So that, that's the way I separate you're, and categorize. You're, you're shattering, you're shattering my illusions here, Jess. That part of my brain that thinks Tarzan is real is just suffering <laughs> at the moment. Oh, he's real. He's real in that alternate universe. He's real <laughs> yeah, as he okay. be over there. There we and go. I live over there, so I, so I, so I'm fine with it. That's where I, I I just visit the real the real real world. That's yeah. what I need to. I've I've been to Africa six times, I think, on short-term missionary trips, and I have I'm bitterly disappointed that I haven't stumbled across the lost city yet. So <laughs> keep looking. <laughs> keep looking. There, there are portals hidden all over Africa. There we that go. That will take you into this alternate universe. So keep looking. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think they call them lost? <laughs> yeah. <there you go. laughs> Good point. Okay. Good point. So Al, one thing I wanted, one chapter I really enjoyed 
was the one that talked about whether or not Elmo Lincoln literally killed a lion while filming. And I, I love the way you presented that. Once again, you know, it was presented in as factual a possible manner. But, and I guess Elmo always claimed that he actually did later on, if I remember what the documentary said. I just yes. was curious. I was curious. Do you have an opinion if you had to say yes or no? Do you think Elmo well, Lincoln killed I would say he did. I know Jerry Snyder doesn't think he did, uh, but I think <coughs> he did because, you know, at that time, uh, uh, even if you see a Weissmiller film, they have a they have one scene that they used over and over a line charging him and they shoot him with a gun. Back mm -hmm. then, they didn't they didn't think about, you know, the Humane Society had no real authority or impact on the movie industry at all. And probably not to the Hayes Code, which this is all pre Hayes stuff. But uh, uh, I think that I think that he did kill it. You know, interesting thing about that. We met with his daughter. Uh, who wrote a really good book about my father, the first Elmo Lincoln, the first Tarzan, and uh, I can't think of her right, her name right now. Anyway, uh, we met with her and uh, at her, and we went to her home and everything, and uh, we actually rented a theater there in uh, Los Angeles, uh, and that was a silent movie theater that he had taken his daughter to see the movie. Uh, when she was a very young girl and she was like in her mid seventies at this time. And uh, she said, she told me that he had showed her the knife and uh, it said that it was a knife that he used to kill the animal. And uh, uh, the thing about it was she was 16, I think when he, when he passed away and she was going to spend a few days or the summer with him at his apartment and when she goes up to the house, people are coming out of the apartment with all kinds of artifacts and stuff. Mm. And she walks in and somebody says, oh, your dad died. And all these people were stealing stuff from him. My goodness. And stole the That's knife. Mm. Somebody has that knife. His but, daughter would be Marsha Lincoln? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was that knife like a bayonet, like a military bayonet? What kind of knife was it? Yes. Uh-huh. He had two of them, but the one he used to, they, the first one they tried wouldn't penetrate the skin. Uh, and so they got a more of a military bayonet and he used that one, I think, to, to, uh, uh, <coughs> to actually kill the animal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they did prop it up and that sort of thing. And he hit it again. You know, they do all these multiple takes from angles and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's really not any doubt in my mind. And I, I personally, I also believe that there's still monkeys there. Uh, there were no apes uh brought in because you know a chimpanzee is a they're very social and they're also very dangerous mm -hmm. so you you let a chimpanzee go and they they're nine times stronger than a human uh they they would have come out of the woods and killed somebody and you know that when a, a chimpanzee is very young they're sweet they like to play but the, when they get three or four years old and they're an adult they don't really enjoy playing anymore and they're easily provoked uh, it's, it's kind of funny to me, you always hear about gorillas and chimpanzees, and we think of gorillas as being bad, chimpanzees being good, but it's actually the opposite. Gorillas are all herbivores, and they mostly have those fangs and stuff to, uh, uh, as a combat or conflict or conflict behavior. So uh, anyway, I do think that he killed the, the okay. tiger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree um, that the standards for taking care of animals in movies were very low then through the, the 30s, uh, th you know, from that time, at least through the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, Charge of the Light Brigade with Errol Flynn killed hundreds of horses when they were showing the final oh. battle scene. They were wow. tripping them to represent getting shot by the Russian cannons. So mm. standards were sadly low. Mm -hmm. yeah, anything I, I, for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great movie, but it's kind of depressing <laughs> when you think about all those horses are actually being hurt. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I, so. another thing about your documentary that I really enjoyed, I want to make sure that we mention here is the the many uh, experts and speakers that you had who, who uh, commented during the course of the film, and several of those were noted Burroughs fans, members of the Burroughs yeah. bibliophiles. And I've got a laundry. I don't, I'm always hesitant to list names because I'm afraid of leaving somebody out. So forgive me if I, if I, if I've left out someone that was not intentional. But my reckoning is, 
these are the uh, Burroughs fans that spoke very eloquently and, and very informed during the course of your documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. Scott Tracy Griffin, who's acknowledged Tarzan expert, yeah. particularly where the movies are concerned. Um, uh, Danton Burroughs' daughters, Lana Jane and Deja Burroughs, were there. Uh, Jim Thompson, who was an instructor down, I think, at Austin Pay University down there, down in Tennessee, uh, spoke about um, uh, the young Tarzan and learning how to read. Uh, Dorothy Howe, who is, uh, I believe, she's a professor in, in uh, the Northeastern USA, I believe, involved in, in writing there. Lee Strong, who's written a couple of books for Burroughs, Inc. Uh, Bill Hillman, who is who maintains the ERB Zine website and works 24-7, because I'm up, <laughs> up in the wee hours in the morning, and I see Bill yeah. posting there in the wee hours in the morning. Uh, the late George McWhorter, someone who I admired a great deal, yeah. assembled the massive ERB collection of the University of Louisville. And Jim Solos, the, um, the president of ERB, Inc., and John Burroughs, who would be uh, Danton's brother, uh, John Burroughs, chairman of the board for ERB. For ERB Inc. And if I left anybody out, my apologies. But that was, I think, our first class all-star lineup of people to come in and comment on, on on this film and this period in Tarzan history. Yeah, they were they were they were a real find. <laughs> you know, the, and I just kept going to conventions and uh, telling them about it. And they were all kind of leery at first, you know, because they said a number of people had tried to do Tarzan documentaries before or had, and they weren't really happy with what they did. Uh, but uh, my daughter Allison went with me, of course, to film it, and they all fought, fell in love with her. <laughs> so it kind of made it easy, easier for me. You know, she's just such a wonderful person. And uh, but Bill Hillman it was a tremendous help. Oh man, uh, his herb gene and all the materials he had, and and calling him and talking to him, and and uh, he was super duper, and he's he still. Uh, someone that I tremendously admire and uh, look to for anything Burroughs. Well said. I, I think a great deal of Bill. And uh, I visit his website, erbzine.com, regularly. I often joke when he looks at his statistics of use, there's the statistics over here that shows all the general use, then I have my own category. I'm in, that, I'm in those <laughs> that website so much. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love that site. Yeah. I, I visit it a lot myself. Yeah. Hey, um, you mentioned before we had started recording, you mentioned your daughter, Allison, did all the editing. And I think a lot of people who don't know anything about filmmaking don't appreciate just how important the editing is. Yes. Um, so, you know, especially if you were doing all these interviews at different times and different places and she puts it all together in a coherent uh, manner, um, just, you know, so that it looks good on screen and is informative is, uh, and it's, it's just, it takes an extraordinarily talented person to do that well, and, yeah, uh, I, and, and I can I can never repay her for what all she did for us there. Mm -hmm. uh, we shot over seventy hours mm -hmm. of uh, video, and I went through and uh, and started with the chisel on it, knocking stuff off that I didn't think really really tell the story. We we worked out the categories, the chapters, what we wanted to say, mm -hmm. and then we went looking for the footage we had or that we could buy. Uh, to get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I checked in with the copyright office and found out that anything, uh, anything that's pre-1921 is public domain. Mm -hmm. so that's the reason we could use uh, the chaplain and the Hitler stuff and all that in there. Uh, but she, she was excellent cinematographer. I got to tell this little story. We were, uh, uh, when we were shooting the the portion of the documentary where we're following the uh, the uh, uh, swamp tour, mm -hmm. and I had a, a camera boat that was we were behind or in front or wherever, and we were going up the uh, bayou uh, toward the the locks, and I had it storyboarded where we were going to start off on the right and then drop back, jump the waves, and go on the left side, and uh, the uh, my daughter was sitting on the front of the boat, just sitting on the front of the boat. And, as, and when we got in the boat, they uh, they said, "Here's the life jackets," and they threw them down on the floor. And they said, uh, "You don't have to wear them; they just have to be in the boat." And I said, "I'm wearing a life jacket, and so is she." <laughs> you know, I said, "I don't trust my swimming." So anyway, we we come up on the right side of the boat, and they were speeding along, probably around 45 miles an hour. 
and then we drop back and she's still shooting and we hit that that center wake uh there and and i'm sitting on in the boat and it throws me out of the boat into the bayou and mm -hmm. almost she didn't get thrown out but i did mm. and uh i have my life jacket on and for some reason i held onto the chair and I had the chair with me and I was holding it and it was kind of pulling me down, but I didn't want to lose it. And it flowed up and somebody <laughs> hit it, you know? So uh, I went into the, uh, the water uh, on that one. But, and they kept saying, get him the alligators. And of course, you know, alligators don't go up. They're, they're kind of backwater. They're not in the large midstream thing. But anyway, that was a kind of an interesting experience. Would have been the perfect moment actually for Tarzan to leap in and save you from an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If we'd had a rubber uh, alligator crocodile, he would have done it, I'm sure. <laughs> there's, there's probably still a rubber alligator uh, left left over from some of the early movie days. Yeah, I was, I was, I was going. I was going to ask you about about gators. What, what kind of hazards did you all have in filming your? And you just described one in filming your documentary. I was thinking about gators. And I was thinking about malaria and maybe other other things that might might have run into. Any kind of hazards that you ran into besides what you've already told us? No, we that was the only mishap that we had. Uh, now, when they made the documentary, as it says, made the film rather than we mentioned the documentary, they had a problem with malaria and large doses of quinine. And and you know, one thing that we that's not in the film, and it's because we couldn't get more than one source, was that they were when they were making this film. Uh, in the 1917, uh, there was on the crew, a uh, film crew, a woman dressed as a man, and she was a spy. <laughs> and she was watching them build ships uh, at Berwick, which was across the river from Morgan City. And she was reporting to the Germans. <laughs> and when, they, when oh. the film wrapped, she, as a he, went with him to Hollywood and finished the film and then from there, she traveled up to San Francisco and was arrested with a whole bunch of other spies. Um, oh, wow. Well, that's uh, pretty wait, cool. That is a cool story. Was she mistaking the movie making stuff for possible wartime? Uh, well, she, she was just using it as a cover. Oh, I see. So she, so she, she could watch the actual ship, ship building. Okay. They brought their own crew from California. Okay. You know. So, uh, yeah, I see. So that is a but cool during story. The, the first war there, it was, and I talked to a number of uh, people that lived there in Morgan City. It was nothing for the Germans to be walking around in town, mm -hmm. you know, going to the supermarket and buying stuff, you know, from the ships. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Um, so uh, when the when the documentary was completed. Um, just, I'm just curious, where did you first screen it? Um, there in Morgan City, it was the first screen. Okay, okay, yeah. And they, you know, they were so kind to us. And and uh, every, I, I took a lot of my vacation time after we finished the film, going down to Morgan City and meeting with uh, Carrie Stansberry, who was the head of, uh, and she still is the head of tourism down there. And she did an excellent job. She formed a committee of mm -hmm. town people. We got together and we, worked for months preparing for this festival. And uh, one thing that I, I did that, I, that worked, worked really well for us to pay for advertising where we didn't have to actually give money was uh, uh, I had a sculptor friend of mine make a little monkey and paint it gold mm. and had a little fez on its head, you know, and we called it the golden monkey. Mm. And the people from Morgan City decided where to hide it. <laughs> and in the in the area and we she got a hospital to donate five hundred dollars uh for whoever found the monkey and had to be on public property and then they came up with with uh for like three weeks before the festival a um, clues of how to find it <clears throat> and and so the newspaper the television uh, radio, everybody bought into it. I mean, the newspaper gave us a section every day for the newest clue. And when people started hunting for it, it became news, front page news of people walking through backyards of people at 6 a.m. And 
uh, it turned into a really big deal. And they gave us quite a few interviews in that area. And uh, the state got behind it. They, they invited, uh, they made it, they declared August the 12th, 2012, Tarzan Day in Louisiana. And the Burroughs family and Jim Sullis and them and uh, Hillman's, we all went to the state capitol during a session. They stopped the whole session. And when they introduced the Burroughs family, the, every one of the uh, uh, House representatives gave a Tarzan yell. <laughs> and then they, yeah. And then they presented it to, they presented the proclamation to them there in the uh, uh, House of Representatives in Baton Rouge. Oh. And I mean, you couldn't ask for a, a, a better promotion. Mm. And tons of magazines uh, did stories on it. Uh, in fact, the AP put it on their wire, and 150 newspapers all over the world picked up the story about the festivals and the documentary. So uh, we screened it there first, and then we brought it to Shreveport, where I live, and we screened it here. <clears throat> That's wonderful. And then a year later, in, in Marshall, Texas, uh, they screened it, and the guy who did the music for us, Kermit Poling, who is who's really well known, uh, he, uh, he had an entire orchestra play the music to the film. And you talk about it. Glorious! It was it was unbelievable. Um, so, were you planning when you were doing the documentary? Were you always planning on also releasing a restoration of the film itself? Oh yeah! yeah. When we got it, we got a uh, a dub from a uh, thirty five millimeter print, mm -hmm. which we had digitized, and we got it. We kept, started looking at it. It didn't make any sense, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the, if you go on uh, YouTube and look at some of them, they either have no music or they have Tin Pan Alley type music. Mm -hmm. And uh, in watching the film, I kept thinking, something's wrong with this. It's just all scrambled up. So I took the book and recut the film to follow the book and as best I could. Mm -hmm. Of course, originally it was over two hours long and it had been cut down. Most of the Great Britain scenes were taken out because uh, people really liked the jungle stuff and which I don't blame them. But uh, the uh, uh, it was it was really in poor condition. We punched up the blacks and the whites and the grays, and uh, put it in correct order and added a few things to it. And then I, I contacted Kermit and uh, and got him to do the music. And I wrote him. I said, "Here's the deal." I, I met with him. I said, "Here's the thing: no piano, no organ." I don't want it to sound like a silent movie. I want it to sound like an orchestral piece. And what I want you to do is interpret the film, the story. And I think, in my opinion, he did he did gloriously interpret that film. Mm -hmm. And it just turned out wonderful the way, in, in my opinion, what he had done. Uh, in fact, it, there's places in there where a gun is shot. And you'll hear uh, a, a sound effect instrument Mm -hmm. uh, for it. And so uh, I think that now it's very watchable film mm -hmm. and uh, entertaining. I actually, I agree with that. It, it's, it, it was a just, I'm glad in addition to the documentary, I'm glad that led to a restoration of that film. And I will concur that the music you guys did for it, that Kermit did for it is superb. Um, and uh, I wish more old silent movies would get that same tre treatment. Was he also fun. did uh, Nosfer Nos Nosferatu? Nosferatu. Yeah. Nosferatu. <laughs> that Dracula movie. Yeah, he right. did a uh, thing of that. And it's mm -hmm. awesome also. Yeah. He plays that live in Halloween, different places. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you went back to the book to cut the film to as, as a guide for cutting the film. I do uh -huh. appreciate one part, another part of the documentary I really appreciated was a discussion of the changes made from the book and always point, being wow. very clear when the movie departs from the books and the character of, is his name Bins? Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, who's an addition in order to tie the different scenes together. Um, and I, that, I appreciate that because I, in, in the end, what I enjoy the most is story. You know, whether mm -hmm. I'm reading a book or watching a movie, listening to an old time radio, for me, the story has to work. And so that you guys did an analysis of, why they changed some of the story or added a character to it 
for the sake of making it into a movie was particularly fascinating for me. And I, I really appreciated that part of the documentary. I like, I like the thing the, uh, about the Ben's character is it, it's such a fantastic leap to think that Tarzan could find those books. Mm -hmm. And even though he had 10 years to do it, figure out that they weren't little bugs, but letters and not only mm -hmm. letters, but sounds and words and sentences and all that sort of thing. Uh, that's a giant leap, I think. Uh, well, in your documentary, uh, Jim Thompson comments on that very thing and says that could be perhaps Tarzan's greatest achievement is figuring out how to read. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And well, I, always thought it was I always thought it was interesting that uh, Burroughs, who had never really written fiction before, sat down one day and started cranking out stories like Princess of Mars and, <laughs> and Tarzan of the Apes. And, and here, here his lead character himself is learning how. So Burroughs is learning how to write fiction, um, self-taught. And his one of his lead characters, Tarzan, is learning how to read, uh, read words and read books. Also self-taught. I thought that was an interesting parallel there. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. I would. I would agree. And I think. I think that uh, Ben's, uh, who who as you see, there's one shot that I have of him in England where he's telling the Greystoke family about about Tarzan. That's not in the film. Uh, but he, I think he was the cohesive character there mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that brought it. I, and I attribute that probably to Lois Weber, uh, who was one of the writers. And uh, in the, Year, in the, Years ago in uh, college, I had a 24-week course, part one and part two, literature and film. And, and our deal there was one week we'd read like Great Expectations then see the David Lean movie the next Monday. And we would get tested. They would know whether or not we read the book by according <laughs> to the test. We'd have to write uh, the little uh, essay paragraphs on things to answer about the movie or book. And we had uh, my college advisor, who was also the head of the film department, taught one half of it. And the head of the English taught the other. But it really really made clear that there are two different mediums and how they have to be handled so the general audience can follow the story. And the character of Ben does a great job of uh, bringing that whole thing together. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. And there's, there's another thing that I mentioned in the documentary, but I didn't go into it very much, was the fact that uh, you remember when Tarzan was very young, he was attacked and really hurt for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in, in the movie, they dealt with it not with a ape attack, but with uh, him being shot by one of the Arabs. Uh, and there's actually, I think, a, a shot or two that I, that, that I didn't put into the, the film where it goes into a little bit more about, uh, maybe I just didn't put it in the right order or something, but about it makes it a little better, more self-explanatory about him being shot and how much how wounded he was and then of course the, the the glaring one is those little acrobat guys in the monkey suits uh fighting the uh tars and that would have really looked kind of silly uh uh and you know the the thing about it that there's always gotten me about in the regular movies is the use of gorillas and apes instead of trying as instead of going with the mangani which was Really, uh, according to Burroughs, I think his stab at missing Link. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they, if anybody ever portrayed it as Mangani or missing Link, I think that 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 might ca cause people to look at the uh, Tarzan character a little differently. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but those little guys—they were incredible. Mm -hmm. Uh, you alluded to something a moment ago that I want, I want to touch on. That was the impact of women in this movie. Um, the, you know, you meant to mention a, a screenwriter, uh, Lois, forgive me. Weber. Weber, thank you. That, that, she, that, that she was one uh, in, involved in creating this film. And the other thing that comes out in your documentary, which I think is an important point, is Jane coaching Tarzan on how to be romantic. Uh, a point that in, in my discussions regarding the Tarzan character that I try to make to people is that he didn't have anyone to guide him as he was growing up as to right and wrong. His, his, his uh, principles were based in large part 
on his experience with those Mangani and living life in the jungle. It's far different, say, than li living in civilization. He didn't have a, par a parent, a father, a mother, or, or someone who he respected and trusted to, to go to him and say, this behavior is incorrect, this behavior is wrong. Um, Akala, his, his ape uh, foster mother, did the best she could, but she didn't know anything about what it was to be a human. Uh, so, so uh, I, I think I think the point points in your documentary regarding the film about Jane coaching Tarzan, I think I think was 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 very good. Thank you. Uh, this this uh, something that fascinated me about the um, Mangani and uh, and Tarzan as far as learning right from wrong is it's not it's not told enough that the Mangani did have a language and they did have uh, a society. And they had rules, and uh, they had. Uh, it's really not talked much about religion, except their, their dumb dumb meetings, uh, which is by the light of the moon, uh, and uh, their dance and that sort of thing. Ritual where that would, would be one time where they would eat meat uh, because they had conquered an enemy or something. Uh, but the Manganis did have a civilization, so it it makes it where he wasn't totally feral. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and he did recognize that uh, he was different from the Van Mangalian looks. Uh, I think I think it was in your I think it was in your I've encountered this over the weekend. I think it was in your documentary that when Tarzan was with civilization, he yearned to be with the apes. And when Tarzan was with the apes, he yearned to be with people. <laughs> yeah. uh, which I thought yeah, Howe said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Mm -hmm. It's a good line. I may have to borrow it some. I'll give you all. Go right ahead. <laughs> of course, she's big on intellectual property. She's written a whole thing on it, you know. So, uh, but she wouldn't mind. She'd be honored. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, uh, Scott, Jess, do you guys have any more questions? I just enjoyed hearing more of yeah. everything that was going on. Yeah. Yes. I love the German spy story, if nothing else. But, yes. yes. <laughs> but, I see a movie there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's but, been a couple of people who talked about writing that screenplay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I have no desire to make any more documentaries. You know, I kind of got in and out of that business quick. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have I haven't made a great deal of money on it, but uh, I have made some. So it wasn't a total thing. I've seen I've sold the, the videos all over the world uh, and sold the, the Tarzan posters and the sort of thing. And that, that really helped us finance it. Uh, in fact, financing, it was kind of funny. I'm in North Louisiana and the Tarzan and Morgan City's in South Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of a uh, uh, stuck because I went to the people in North Louisiana. I said, I want to do a documentary about Tarzan, that Tarzan film shot in South Louisiana. They said, oh, South Louisiana? Well, you need to go get your money in South Louisiana. So uh, I went down to South Louisiana and I talked to him. I said, uh, I'm trying to get a grant to make this film. They said, where do you live? I said, Bozier. And they said, oh, that's North Louisiana. You need to go get your money in North Louisiana. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny deals there. So uh, there was a, a man that had a sign company. And and when I first started with the film, I just mentioned to him one day, uh, he did a lot of work for the science center that I uh, printing for them. And I just mentioned to him that I was doing this. And man, he caught it. He got the, he got, he said, listen, he said, I want to help you. Anything you need, I will do it. I'll print it. I'll do it. And so he printed uh, 200 of those Tarzan posters and gave oh, them wow. to me. Wow. And I saw $25 a piece, and that helped pay for parts of the film. And then uh, he did a giant banner that we put in front of the uh, Louisiana State Museum. Uh, if, uh, if you go, I don't know if I have stuff on there or not, uh, but I, I think I have some pictures of the, uh, the exhibits at the museum. But uh, all the stuff we did, writing and anything that was printed, he donated mm -hmm. to it, to the thing. And so uh, he, was, uh, he was very instrumental in it. And there was another guy that I know who's in my Sunday school class. And he, uh, he one day came after Sunday school and he said, uh, 
I want to help you financially with this film. And I said, listen, you don't make money off of a documentary. I said, I can't take your money. I said, I don't have a nonprofit. I don't even have an LLC, nothing, nothing like that. He said, no, I want to help you. And I said, no, I'm not going to, I must can't take your money because there's no way you'd ever get it back. And so he just kept bugging me. One day he asked me to go to lunch with him. And I, then we sat down, he handed me a check for $5,000. He said, use this. I don't care if I ever get it back or not. And so, uh, uh, he did that and another family sent me $2,000. So that's all the money we had, but it was just a miraculous thing how whatever we needed, like to travel, we went to up north, we went out in California, we went all over the place. Uh, I would, it was, uh, it really was miraculous because if I needed money to do something uh, like travel, then somebody would call me with an art job and it'd be just enough to pay for <laughs> that trip for Allison and I to go. That's awesome. Yeah, it really is. So yeah. we've done well now. Uh, Jensen Media is the distributor for us. And if you go to uh, amazon.com, you can get it through Prime. You mm -hmm. can rent it, you know. Uh, uh, and also the, the Tarzan movie is just on regular Amazon Prime. Uh, the Tarzan the Apes film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, would, I, bought, I bought both mine through Amazon Prime, the both documentary and the copy oh. of Tarzan. There's only recently I caught your name with the re-edited and tied it with the documentary. Oh, oh really? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we would we would just urge people, those of you listening to this, I hope I just I would urge you to go to Amazon and watch the documentary. Um, it's well worth your time if you're a Burroughs fan on any level at all. You're going to really enjoy this just this excellently made informative mm -hmm. documentary. Um, and so, um, you know, just Al, I just really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight and talk about this. Oh, man, I, I loved every second of it. I could talk all night about it. One thing <laughs> I just wanted to mention that, that my daughter and I both have admired or, or that kind of shocked us was... Uh, the way the word Tarzan is pronounced, uh, ac according to most of Burroughs people that I've met, if you're if you came to Tarzan through the books, you call him Tarzan. If you come to him through the movies, it's Tarzan, <laughs> which was uh, what Marino Sullivan called him, Tarzan. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I've always that really shocked my daughter. She that's one of, when she does an interview, she always brings that up. <laughs> about where, where you stand with Tarzan or Tarzan. I think I say Tarzan, but that might just be lazy pronunciation more than trying to follow <laughs> the books. So. Well, I, I, I say Tarzan too. And I think Burroughs called it Tarzan. Mm -hmm. You know, his, uh, I would have liked to have met him. His, uh, his uh, family, they, oh, let me tell you, I do want to mention this, that the uh, ERB Inc. is, they're tremendous people. Mm -hmm. They are very benevolent and uh, very kind, generous people. And uh, they helped us an awful lot. George McWhorter helped us tremendous amount. Uh, I got to tell you one George McWhorter story. Uh, we were up at uh, Louisville at the uh, Tarzan thing, which I don't think they have it anymore now that he's passed. I think it's kind of uh, whittled down to a closet or something. I'll, I'll comment on that, but go ahead and tell okay. your story. Uh, anyway, we were we were in the uh, inner sanctum, as George calls it, and we were getting documents to scan and that sort of thing. And I don't know why I was in a room by myself and George was coming and going, you know, walking past me. And uh, I don't even know why I thought this, but I thought, you know, I've been here all morning and, and he has not even offered me a cup of coffee. <laughs> what, a, what a stupid thing to even think, you know, I, I don't know why I would even think that. And so he had, he had just walked past me when I had that thought. And uh, he turned around and walked back over and he said, would you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> 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 it just he blew me so away. <laughs> and also uh, he showed us the urn, you know, uh, that he, his ashes are in. Okay. And it was, it was an urn that his sister had made uh, for him in pottery. And he had it back there where the coffee things were and he was showing it to us. And uh, he said, you know, it needs to be in the exhibit. And so he took it and he put it up there and he said, that's where I'll be looking over the, the Tarzan 
uh, I think that's in the documentary, isn't it, where he talks about that? I'll be overlooking the Tarzan uh, film. I think it may yeah. have been. So. One thing you don't really get from having watching it on uh, Amazon is you don't get the extras. We have the bonus stuff because uh, we have a, a really good interview with George McWhorter that my daughter, it was a documentary she did. And I think that if you, you can get it, uh, I forget, maybe they have it on ERB Zine. Uh, but if you go to makemade.com, M-A-K-E-M-A-D-E, -E, that's my daughter's uh, advertising, a graphic design company. I think she has it where you can watch it there, but it's a really good documentary that she did about George. It's just an interview with him and he talks about, he sings some in it and talks about his life and how he got gout of the throat and that sort of thing, how he started learning to read and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that, and we also have uh, as extra in, uh, on there, we have a bunch of people doing their impression of the Tarzan yell. <laughs> And there's some really good ones and some really bad ones. <laughs> really funny ones, you know. And then we have uh, another thing in there about um, we have we have something about the Atchafalaya River Basin, and then we have uh, a section in there that talks about the Audubon Zoo, which was very kind to us also to let us in there to film and talk to us. But so far as purchasing your documentary and all these experts here you described, does a person go to Amazon for that, or where where would someone go to order those things? That's that's through me. Okay. Uh, you would go to Tar Tarzan Lord, excuse me, <laughs> Tarzan Lord LA Jungle dot com, and okay. you can order it. And okay. uh, it comes um, to me, and I send it out. We sign it and send it out. Yeah. We, we will uh, have that. I'll have that link in the show notes, too, so that people can get right to it. That website. Uh, there's a lot of information yeah. on that website, too. Okay. Yeah. Very so uh, A couple yeah. things about the collection at U of, U of L, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, one of, the, one of the many features of your of your documentary that I like is the time it shows the discussion with George McWhorter and the collection at the University of Louisville. I, I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I'd gotten to know George in his latter years, and I'd been over there in the 1990s. But I was working full time and overtime, and I didn't have time to hang out there at the university like I would have liked to in, in, yeah. in, in, in years, years and years ago. But I did get to know George better in his latter years. And you are, and first of all, he was extraordinary. And when you talk about him singing, he was an opera singer, a professional opera singer, and he could belt it out. Uh, I yeah. can tell you that that he was sitting in a, in a hospital room, um, which turned out that everything was okay, but he was talking with the nurses and he just bellowed out some opera song. And, <laughs> and he, was in, he was in full voice and it was just extraordinary to hear him sing. Um, now, regarding the collection, the, the collection, the Edgar Rice Burroughs collection, which is the largest publicly accessible collection in the world uh, for Burroughs, Edgar Rice Burroughs, is... Um, still at University of Louisville, and it is Good. still on display. But the old display room that is shown in your uh, documentary no longer exists. That's been whittled down, and you're right. It is, um, it is, it is a, um, uh, a single display now that measures. I, I've, measured, I've actually stepped it off. I think it was 9 feet by, no, let's say 12 feet by 3 feet, I would say. Just a big display cabinet. Uh, other items are available, but you have to request them to examine them. So it takes probably 30 minutes to walk in there and look at it. It's, it's wow. not like it's not like the old display room uh, that you saw in the documentary. And I think I think that's a shame because that display room was loved by a lot of people, including me. But the, the collection itself does still exist, just that most of it's under lock and key now. It's amazing because I, I know a number of guys who have it in their will that all their collection goes to that. Right. Deep. So I don't maybe maybe uh, in Tarzana they'll gonna do something with it. I'd love to see that. I, you know, they had several warehouses. I don't know if they still have any, but how many they have, they still have some, but one of them burned mm -hmm. uh, because they had all that old nitrate film in there, which right. is very flammable. Right. Well, there's, 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 there's still a warehouse someplace, but I don't know the specifics. Mm -hmm. But um, you're, you're right. I would love to see that stuff on display. I, I know in the old display room, 
it was a very popular stopping point. I, I've heard of, of artists and, uh, and fans spending the day there with George, and he was very kind. He was, I know, I know when I went, he was very gracious with his time. And he would he would spend all day talking to you about about Burroughs and about Tarzan and the other characters. Did he give you any coffee? No, I didn't ask for coffee. <laughs> I, I wasn't much of a coffee drinker in those days. I am now. <laughs> Oh, George, he's a great guy. I loved him. He's a very I special really person. Did. And and it, it, it's fandom's loss that he's gone. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, 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 other, the other thing I wanted to mention earlier on, and uh, to pay a, a, a homage here to uh, Scott, Tracy, Scott Tracy Griffin's comments about the impact of Tarzan. And, and, and you see this in studying the history. A lot of people today, when I encounter people, whether it's on Facebook or just I bump into them on the street, and I'll stop and talk to anybody. But you know, the subject of Tarzan comes up. Maybe I've got a T-shirt on or something like that. And uh, first of all, they may not even know who the character is. And then they don't realize the marketing impact or promotional impact that that character had uh, from, from books, original books, to movies, to newspaper uh, versions of the stories, to, to comic books, to comic strips, uh, television, radio, um, and food products, uh, ice cream, and bread. For example, Tarzan uh, had had that marketing appeal that we see from uh, Superman, Batman, other big name heroes like that. Mm -hmm. But Tarzan was the first. Yeah, I mean, he predates the, the Disney uh, juggernaut, you know, in mm -hmm. the 19, I think, uh, didn't he incorporate 1921 or something like that, Burroughs? Something and, like that. Yeah. You know, he, he, he was able to do what you have to do if you're going to be a, a writer or a creator, and that is learn how to step outside of uh, your product and, and uh, promote the product. Mm -hmm. uh, most people think, oh, people are going to think I'm you know, conceited and that sort of thing. But if you see it as a widget, you know, and I think that's what Burroughs did. He saw it as an opportunity to, to merchandise himself, mm -hmm. uh, and he did it very well. Yeah, as, I, as I recollect, he was the first author to publish his own books. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, what, he would, what would he do with Kindle? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kindle publishing now, you know, that's my, I, I'm a pulp writer and I have a number of books here, but uh, I, I'll do all mine through uh, uh, Kindle publishing. Mm -hmm. Sure. So anyway, uh, he was, a, he was a master at it. Mm -hmm. how many books have been written about him and it was an honor just to I feel like I know him even though I never would have met him uh, and I really have thought about going back because I had a, quite a bit of I probably interviewed John Burroughs for an hour and there was an awful lot about his granddad and his experiences with him uh, that I didn't that we didn't I really should have put an extra special features just with uh, John Burroughs talking about his grandfather but it was very touching. That that'd be really interesting. Because mm -hmm. yeah. he would have gotten a kind of a feel. He said that his dad, his grandfather, uh, had a when he was around him and talking to him, had kind of a W.C. Fields uh, attitude. Yeah, boy, come here, boy. You know, kind of, <laughs> come here, boy. You know, them father me. <laughs> That's good. So maybe I'll do that someday. I've got all the, the I've got all the uh, hard drives. It would be that would be a worthwhile thing to have out there for people to see. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do so, um, okay. Well, just Al, once again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Those of you listening, please make a point of watching this documentary. Um, mm -hmm. Buy a copy if you like. Make Al rich beyond the dreams of avarice, and we don't mind that. Um, and so, um, but I will print, I will uh, have Al's website and also uh, his daughter's website for graphic design in the show links. I looked that up after you mentioned it. She's just, she's just extraordinarily talented. I mean, her stuff looks great. So I'll, have that. Her, of course. Mm -hmm. I'll put that in the show notes as well. So everybody listening to this, you'll have easy access to be able to watch the documentary and to watch the restored version of the film, which is well worth watching. Um, and uh, thank you again. Before we finish, just on another subject, I wanted to do a brief shout out to a fan we have in England named Jim and his son, Harry, 
And it's going to be at the beginning of the next episode that we are going to read his account in a new feature will be my first ERB. Uh, we're gonna read Jim's uh, just very entertaining account about how he became a Burroughs fan. And Jim, we appreciate your uh, listening. And um, um, I promise that you and Harry will be mentioned prominently uh, in the next episode. And uh, I just didn't want, you, I didn't want them to think they'd for, I'd forgotten them. Um, and uh, so Al, thank you again. Uh, thank you. To sign out, my name is Tim DeForest. Um, you can find my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff, and you can find links to my books there, and you can all make me rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Um, and uh, Jess and Scott, you want to uh, plug anything before we go? Well, I'll just invite thanks for everyone a great to... evening. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Scott, go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Oh, I... Whoops, Scott just froze up. Yes, that's, that's technology. Scott, if you can still hear us, I'm afraid you froze up. So, Jess, go ahead. Um, I just want to invite everybody to a Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. We'll uh, enjoy talking Burroughs with you. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that is it for tonight. We'll be back with another episode soon, and we will still be uh, releasing the mini podcasts as often as possible, which right, right now are doing a chapter by chapter analysis of A Princess of Mars. And thank you all again for listening. We'll be back soon.